All right, that was a wonderful time of worship. I love that. I feel like I should go back to that ego picture. You don't need to, but I feel like I should go back to that ego picture and we can just start a whole message there. About 50 of them, right? What's your favorite part about the ego? And is Pastor Aaron talking about egos again? This was a real common problem I had, especially in the youth room. But amazing birds, it's like it'll trigger me to start talking about them just seeing a picture, right? God's amazing creature. You think if you were going to go out hunting, you would not put yellow up, right up front, right? Okay? But it's brilliant. It's a brilliant distraction, because guess what they're looking at? That yellow coming in up front right at them. And guess what comes right behind it? Another yellow. <laughs> Claws. They never see them coming. It's a brilliant strike. So, don't underestimate how God works. Don't underestimate his plan. Realize, that's my sermon illustration right there that wasn't planned, but realize there's more to the story than when you see. There might be claws tucked behind. There might be more to do. There might be something more going on. So today is really exciting. You just get to sit back, relax, enjoy. We're going to be wrapping up this book of 2 Timothy today. We'll be in chapter 4, looking at this idea of allegiance. But this is just Paul talking, so it's okay. You can just sit back and relax, because all we're going to do is hear about the Apostle Paul today, what he believes, how he feels, how he thinks, what the Holy Spirit has put on his heart to share, and then we get to do with it whatever the Holy Spirit's doing with us. But it's this idea of allegiance. What does that mean? Right? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. What does that mean? I don't know, it pretty much means if there's what? I guess if there was a day I would die for this. Now, we live in a culture that they say, hey, we're going to have a draft, and you know what the number one problem is? They don't know what they're going to do at the borders because there would be a massive exodus probably. I don't know. Pledge allegiance. There was a time people pledged allegiance to this flag, Constantine. There's kind of a not-so-pretty part of our culture that has this flag attached to it. There's some cool parts, right? So that kind of, but we're going to be talking about a different kind of allegiance. One that I hope that in, in this you have some, right? Because I think it's good to pledge allegiance to your country, to be loyal, to see where God's called you, to follow the laws, to follow the ways, to be a good citizen. God bless America. I love that's on our money. I love that that's some part of our foundational. But my real allegiance needs to lie somewhere else. And that's what Paul's trying to tell me today. And so let's look at what that looks like. Okay. Allegiance. Devotion or loyalty to a person, a group, a cause, or a political party. So we have allegiances that show up all, all kinds of ways in our culture like this, right? We see it where if you're a Mariners fan, baseball, you're allowed to hang out with me. Actually, I'm okay with whatever as long as you like baseball. Evidence, I have friends that like the Houston Astros. It's okay, right? Yeah, so there you go. But where do our allegiance lie? Are we a football fan? Are we a, what are we doing with our lives? Where is our identity? lie. Because even more importantly than our allegiance, often our identity lies in our allegiance. I'm a pastor. I'm loyal to pastors. If I meet another pastor, all of a sudden we're like, yeah. I don't know. We have weird allegiances in this world. And so what does that look like? But in the end of the day, I think God calls us to be in allegiance to him. His plan his way, his mission. Turn with me to Matthew 10, 32 through 39. Let's just hear what Jesus has to say. He's going to talk a little bit about allegiance, or at least that's what I think it is. It's like a loyalty calling. Hop in right here. He says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before people, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. So in case you haven't figured it out, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am confessing him right now as my Lord and Savior. 
I'm doing that for four people. I suggest you all do that, right? But whoever denies me before people, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Okay. This happens. This happens in subtle ways. I think this has happened to everybody at times where we said, oh, I wish I would have said that. Or I wish I could have said, right? Okay. This might not be denying him. This might be an example of needing to learn what to do next time. Okay? Denying him would be if you turn to somebody and go, I don't believe in, okay, which I'm not going to go down that road or even say that because it might, might brainwash myself to believe something wrong. All right, it's important what you talk to yourself. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I tell myself that all the time. Okay. Here we go, 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on, the earth, peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but as a sword. For I came to turn man against his father, daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And person and enemies will be in the members of his household. So there's going to be enemies in here. The one who loves the father or the mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So you can love your mom and your dad. You can love one another. Love Christ more. Understand that this is a different love. Different love. Pick up your cross. Follow me. That's what he says. And the one who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. I really encourage you today to figure out what the heck that means in your own life. Really. What does it mean to pick up your cross? I don't believe it means to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Come ask me why. I don't want to go down that road today. But I think we all have a cross to bear, a cross to carry. All right. The one who loves the Father more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves the Son or Daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The one who has found his life will lose it. And the one who has lost his life on my account will find it. There's a really cool life to find that Jesus has for you. He has a life that's unmeasurable, unimaginable. Ten years ago, I was up running a bakery. And if you would ask me what my 10-year plan was, silly. God had something crazy better. I get to do life with you guys. I get to teach people about Christ. I get to walk with Christ. I get to live with him every day, every moment, in crazy ways. So I, if you haven't figured it out, pledge allegiance to Christ. The question is, is where does your allegiance lie? Where does it really lie? And do we need to shift how that looks a little bit in our lives? So I encourage you to do that. So let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We kind of pick up at 6 because we left off at 5 last week to see the Apostle Paul's response to this. Because really... I don't want to know what Aaron's response is or what anybody out. This guy is a rock star for Christ. He's killing it. He wrote 13, 14 books of the New Testament. God threw him. I think most people would say that Paul is one of our rock stars, right? So don't you want to hear what he has to say? So he says, 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. At the time of my departure has come. See, Paul is nearing the end of his time in ministry. He knows this. He's imprisoned. Somehow he's taken that concept of the eagle that will strengthen him, and he's used God's strength, and he's flown, and now he's being poured out, and he's at the end, right? And I believe he is feeling drained, and not drained in a I need more type of way, but drained in I left it all on the field. So if you're an athlete in here, raise your hand for me. Any kind of athlete, raise your hand. Okay. If you're in any kind of racing, sports cars, motorcycles, going fast, anything. Right? This is he put the medal to the pedal. Right? He left it all in the field. He gave it his all. There was nothing left. Win, lose, or draw. Kids, win, lose, or draw, I gave my all, and I can raise my head and feel good at the end of the day. Okay, why do I say that to young people? Because I get in trouble when I say that to adults. But you guys can take the same advice, right? 
if I left it all on the field, and can I hold my head high? If I really did what God called me to do today, and I'm still shackled in jail, or things don't look the way they're supposed to, Paul thinks so. So let's move on to seven. I'm just going to go one line at a time here because it's so good. How many people want to say this? I fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Got to love that. Feel like you're fighting a fight some days? Maybe we need to find the course. Because when we get on God's plan, I believe there is a fight there. There's a battle. The Lord is battling for lost souls right now. If you haven't figured it out, he's battling for some souls that aren't so lost either. But we can get into that later. Turn to me with, to Hebrews 11, 1 through 2, because I think this is perfectly expresses what Paul says. Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for. The certainty of things hoped for. A proof of things not seen. By, for by it, the people of old gained approval. And so Paul's throwing it down. He wants to gain approval. He wants to leave it all, all on the earth for a lack before he goes on into eternity because we're all eternal beings. So he wants to leave it all on the field. He wants to win, and he's expressing this to us. Here's the reason why. And I thought today we'd just talk about this a little bit because one of the reasons I think the Apostle Paul is so fired up so motivated, so running the race to the end is because he has a full, fuller than me at least sometimes I think, perception of the whole entire Bible. He's got amazing grasp on the whole text. And his amazing grasp on the whole text causes him to draw on terminology and draw on things that should fire us all up. But we're not used to hearing about it. So, here we go. We have five crowns that we can get when we get to heaven. He's referencing just one of them here in 2 Timothy 4.8. In the future there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so, in your theology, you die. Sin has separated us from God. And we're all eternal beings. We have an eternal destination of hell or an eternal destination on heaven depending on what we do with the person of Christ. When we accept him as his Lord and Savior, his righteousness is given to us. What does this look like? Someday I sit down somewhere, start pondering, and Jesus Christ walks up and goes, puts a crown on my head, right? Not just one. I'm like, <laughs> that should freak you out. Why does that freak me out? I don't know. Why does I, why does, okay, this is very intimate. This is very intimate with Christ. This is very personal. This isn't he just left it on the cross someday. This isn't he just grabbed you and he left you like he found you. Christ wants to walk with you, talk with you, impart his righteousness on you, give you a crown that somehow says you trusted him. So, the Greek word crown, for those who need to know this kind of stuff, is Stephanos. We actually get it from Stephen, our first martyr, believe it or not. They, they actually use that word, right? They also have a different wreath that we talk about. But basically, it's a badge, a badge of royalty. So, first, I'm going to move fast through all five crowns. You ready? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. This is important. It's an imperishable crown. Do you not know that those who run a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do not obtain a perishable crown, Right? So this is not like earthly things that go away. Right? But an imperishable crown. Wow. There's a crown. There's treasures. There's things that are coming for me, for what I do here, that will not fade away. 
Does that get you excited? Gets me excited. What if there was something you could do right now to add? I guess we'll just talk to whoever loves money because we all kind of do in this country, right? What if something you could do to start adding drastic amounts of money to your bank account right now? Would you do it? If it was just some simple move, like loving people, would you do that? Would you download big dollars? You know what I mean? Okay. If you knew there was something you could do to make sure you didn't show up bankrupt, because I really believe you can show up bankrupt, right? Okay. Would you do that? Or would you just be like, no, I'm good? What if it was something simple as just loving people? Then you could avoid being bankrupt. Like really loving people. Like actually figuring out, okay, not how to be always right, or always perfect, or always smell the best. Or I am not the perfect Christian in the room, if you haven't figured that out. Some of you are being trained on how to be Christians 20, 30 years before me. Okay. But I do think, by the grace of God, I understand how people want to be loved. I'm going to try and love everybody that way the best I can. But why do we do this? Because we follow a Savior that loves this way. Where are we storing things up? Where are we investing our time? What is truly important to us? Crown of rejoicing is another crown. I love this one. First Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is, not e is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? As Christians, we have more in life to rejoice about than anybody else. Do you believe that? So when the world says, man, COVID blank, as a Christian, I can walk behind and go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, but with Jesus in it, not so blank. Right? Not so stressful, not so angry, not so broke, not so whatever it was for you. But I also understand that this crown of rice is, or the crown of rejoicing is something that also makes us look at things from different perspectives. And I like to talk about this. Somebody want to come up here and describe the best two years of their life? I'll start with mine. It started in 2019. It really did. The last two years have been the best two years of my life. All COVID included, still been better than where I was before. Okay, you have to understand that. I have to land on that. That's why sometimes if you look at me and I look euphorically happy, or maybe happier than the world around me, okay, that's because other than COVID, right, in the last two and a half years, I will have graduated with my bachelor's, graduated with a master's, finished a 17-year stand in youth ministry, God, by the grace of God, got placed in a growing church, right? You know what I mean? Okay? Moved to a really cool town, met really cool people, made some really good, best, hopeful new friends, had some of my old friends move up to join us, right? Not broke, not in debt, not struggling, not, well, I could get stressed over anything, so I could get stressed for fun. How many people can just get stressed for fun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last two years of my life. So perception's a really important thing. Yeah, I had to navigate COVID through that. I had to navigate some things. But you can always navigate something through that. You should see what it was like being a 12, 13-year-old in my household growing up. That was awesome. That was awesome. I have to stop and ask myself on a regular basis, is that okay for my kids to be doing? Even when I know sometimes, I'm pretty sure that's not. Yeah, I had nobody tell me that stuff. Let's move forward to today, the crown of righteousness. Finally, there is laid up for me in heaven a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. This verse is coming up, but I've been also doing another project on it. Titus 3, 4 through 7. Embrace this verse 
mark this verse, write this verse down. We'll be coming back around to it in a couple weeks. But I want you guys to really ponder this for the next couple weeks. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we did in righteousness, but accordance with his mercy. By the washing and the regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we could be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Yep. My dad owns this world. You know? First Peter, a crown of glory. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Though Peter is addressing the elders in the church at the time, this crown is still rewarded to all of those that follow Christ. A massive crown of glory. Because the reality is, is I believe this goes to all those who shepherd. And shepherds can look in a lot of different ways. And so ask yourself, who are you shepherding? Ask yourself, do I get all these five crowns? Do you think we all just automatically get all five crowns? Think through that. Five, the crown of life. So as we're thinking about all these crowns, please do not miss this one. Please. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. You may be tested. Tribulation, 10 days. That means trials are going to come. They'll have some, t t some time in them, right? Okay. 10 is the number of completion. If you look at it from the perspective of a minion, which I don't want to go down that road, so we won't. But there is a number for that 10. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's the important part, right? As you face trials, and you face tribulations, and you face struggles, and you face the number one enemy you have to face, right? Who's the number one enemy you face? We would, yeah, somebody said yourself. I love it. I'll take that. Yourself. The devil uses that as his number one tool, so it can be a real tight combination between those two. That's why you always got to say, how's your self-talk? How are you talking to yourself? I have a tough time sharing the gospel. Ooh, it's easy. Walk up to a mirror. I figured this out the other day. This is great. Stole it from a guy, but I think it's true. Walk up to a mirror and share the gospel with yourself in the mirror. Okay? If you can pull that off, you got no problem sharing it. The problem is, is you can't pull that off. That's where most people are. That's what this guy said, and I think he's right, right? YouTuber, I won't name him, but I like him, okay? You can't say the whole thing. Really, can you not share it? Are you just scared? Are you afraid you'll mess it up, or what is it? What's holding you back? What's holding you back? Go home today, say it in the mirror to yourself, and you'll discover what's holding you back. I know it's kind of a weird thought, right? Okay? If you go like this, and you're like, oh, this is silly, okay, well... There's your problem. You feel weird when you're silly around people. Get over it. You get up there and you start talking, but you don't know the words to say. Learn them. Go back and learn them. But somewhere, there's a crown of life. And I think it has to do with those who stay tested, those who are doing God's work. James says it like this in James 1, 2. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Right? And I'm telling you, if I got to go through some kind of a test or approval to get this crown, I'm in. I'm in. And everybody goes, takes a step back. Because when we say we're in with the Lord, right? Here, I'll put it in other terms. It says right here, Pray for patience. Well, that scares everybody, doesn't it? No, it doesn't scare me. I just want to get it over with. I just want to get it over with. 
If there's a part of my life that doesn't get that part, I want to get it over with. I'm going to pay for patience. I'm a Band-Aid ripper offer guy, if you haven't figured that out. It's very difficult to get around me if you're not, because you're like, oh, it's too fast, too fast. Other people who like to just get out there, run, and rip off Band-Aids and get it done, you know, they'll probably feel more comfortable around me. I apologize if you're not that way. Okay? I really apologize, too, in advance if I actually just rip your Band-Aid off. Because I've been known to do that once in a while. I just get antsy and I walk over. I, Whoops, sorry. So that's where I need to learn to grow and mature. Because you can't do that to people. But the point is, is we all have some Band-Aids. We all need to be transparent. We all need to let people know where we're struggling. We all need to let people know where we're growing. Do you have people like that? I've turned to two or three people in the room over the last week and said, I'm really concerned about this season coming up in my life because I'm going to pick up 14 hours. 14 hours. Do you know what idle hands can do with 14 hours a week? Oh, yeah, who knows, right? Okay, so if you want to, those guys in the room can raise their hand, right? Now, there's really, yeah, Revel's one of them. Well, you know, but I've asked some guys, some real accountable men, to make sure that I don't blow the time. Ask me in two months what I've done with my 14 hours. Because these five crowns are important to me. My walk with Christ is important to me. What I'm doing with my life is important to me. Even when I play video games, I have a deeper motive in it. I really do. It's kind of unfortunate, or maybe it's extremely fortunate. It makes it hard to relax. We talked so long we lost the controller, Caden. You want to get me to slide 108? All right, we're going to move forward. 2 Timothy 9 through 22, we're going to cover this last section. We have three major concerns that Paul is addressing. So you just got Paul's testimony. Fight the good fight. Run it out. Live hard. Apply it to your own life. Here we go. First concern. Make every effort to come to me soon. For Damascus, having loved the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cressius has gone to Galatia, Titus to Demalta. Only Luke is with me. Take along Mark and bring with him with you, for he is useful for me for service. But I have sent Thesco, uh, Tychus to Ephesus. When you come, bring me the overcoat which I left at Tros with Capris, the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did, did me great harm, so avoid that guy. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him, him yourself, too, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. So, warning one, okay? Avoid some of these people that are messed up. For those who like to do some killer studies, there are some amazing studies behind these people that we should all know, Right? Demos was actually a huge player in spreading the gospel, but it looks like he, he discovered the love of money and ran off, right? Do your own homework on that one. That's really cool. The overcoat that's mentioned, okay, is a really interesting thing because there's things that they believe were in that overcoat, smuggling stuff. Do your homework. I'm not going to preach on it. There was a parchment. Don't you want to know which parchment that was? Me too. I know. There's some really good stuff to study there. Go check it out. Right? Why? Because you guys need to look into some of this stuff. And this coppersmith guy, he was really cool. Key things to remember in all of this. Everybody but Luke and Mark have pretty much checked out. Which is good for us. Because they wrote the Gospels. And so if these guys have checked out, we'd have a big problem. So we're realizing that Luke is still hanging out with Paul. All right. How many people think Luke is a major player in the game? He's a big, yeah, big player in this game. He spent most of Paul's ministry with him, right? Supported him, spent most of his ministry with him, was his physician, all right? On top of it, he wrote the book of Luke. On top of that, he wrote the book of Acts, which covers the 30-year period of time. 
we see a period of 50, maybe 60 years with this guy in the game, epicenter in the game, that's pretty impressive. He is what you would call, let's grab a doctor to record everything guy. Because doctors don't make mistakes when they're recording details. Well, they used to not make them. Now we don't know. But Luke was good. All right, second concern. Let's move forward. So first concern, be careful who you surround yourselves with. Second concern. And my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. All right, he's alone. May it not be counted against them. He's showing grace. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. That would be the devil's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then he adds a prayer in there. Don't you love that? So I would really advise you guys to pick this one up, 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 18, and own that. Do you feel that way? Well, at first, when I started doing ministry, nobody supported me. I've been there. I've been there a lot of times. Right? That's okay. If God gives you a vision... Does it matter who supports you? Right? Here, you take about four steps of no support, it's crazy, and then all the support just floods in. But God wants you sometimes to make a couple steps. But the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me so that through the proclamation might become fully accomplished. See, the Lord's going to do his work. See, a lot of times we start getting into ministry, or we pick a ministry, and the first day doesn't go perfect like we wanted, or it was nervous, or I didn't sleep the night before very well. You know what I mean? But we have to trust the Lord. We have to walk. We have to go in. It's easier to turn around. But Paul's saying, no, I, I, I trust the Lord. I'm, he's going to work this through me. The Lord will rescue me out of every crazy situation that pops up. We're going to be good. We're going to be good. Who had to teach a study this morning? Anybody else in here have to teach a study? Yeah, they're not going to raise their hands. But that would probably be the closest group to who lost sleep over having to do a study today. So there is some excitement that goes with leaning in. It would have been a lot easier for them to just say, I don't want to do this. A lot less stressful. Okay, but when we step in, we step in. So what Paul is warning us is this. When you step in, right, there's going to be chaos. If you start doing ministry, checkpoint 12 should be this. Okay, if you're in ministry under me, checkpoint 12 is this, right? Whoa, it would have been better if I didn't get into this. Okay, yeah, we're on track now. We're good, right? Why? Because it's easier to stay home. It's easier to do nothing. It's a little scary when 25 kids show up. You know what I mean? It's a little scary when you're trying to figure out where 15 kids need to get to work on things today. That person, unprecedented grace in my heart, un amazing job, tough to navigate. It'd be a lot easier to just stay home, sleep in, forget it, not get involved. It's the American way. Let somebody else coach my kids. Let somebody else train somebody something else. Let somebody else do it. Let somebody else fix it. Let somebody else solve the problem. How many people even think they can change the world? One person can change the world one person at a time. Yeah, so Trella believes it. I believe it. Do you believe it? Christ calls us to this. This is what the... Yeah, this is what the Apostle Paul is telling us. His second concern is we're not going to do that. We're not going to just try and love the world one person at a time. Third concern is keeping in mind you guys. So this is very important to me. Very important to me. Third concern. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of once Forest. Eridus remained at Corinth, but I left 
Trophimus, sick at Miletus. Just work through those. If you've got a better pronunciation, go for it. Make every, I have the Greek kind of thing to try and help me here. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, Prudus, Linus, Claudia, and all the other brothers and sisters. Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Amen. So what's he telling us there? It's a concern for Timothy. I think it's a praise for Paul. Here's what I hear him saying. He's saying, thank God I am not doing this alone. That's what I think he's saying. Look at these two over here. Look at those. And what he's doing is he's outlining his family tree. There's others going in ministry. Peter's over here. Different pockets going at this time. But he's outlining his discipleship work. Saying, here's the people I invested in. Here's the movements I was part of. Here's the letters I wrote. And at the end of my time, here's my comfort. To you guys. The people. And so Paul's greatest comfort is us. Somewhere Paul hoped that there'd be an Aaron Brenner up here doing this someday. Thousands of years later. That's what these people were hoping. The question is, is what ministry does the Lord have for you? We've been looking at these Bible verses that really outline allegiance. Second Timothy, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful people. See, if we just approach the Bible, like it's just wise statements, okay? Good things, good teacher, no, from God. From God, from God. We don't have a choice in these. He's not, he's not saying, hey, Timothy, if you want to, right, the things you've heard from me, and trust, no, he's, this is an allegiance command. You're in, let's go, let's do this, we're playing. Timothy 4.12, teach these things. Don't say if you want to, and insist that everyone learn them. Teach these things and insist that you learn them. Right? Titus, same way. For the grace of God has appeared to me, bringing salvation to all men. Instructing. So we start getting instructions. We're told. And in the end of Paul's ministry, he only wants us to know one thing. One thought. And the whole book of Titus, which we're going to next, is going to outline it. But here's the thought. On a mission for Christ. Because that's really what the pastoral epistles are for. They're to get us on a mission for Christ. They're to help the person who has just come to faith in Christ, okay? So for the sake of everybody, we'll just pretend that's today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here's your invitation. Our sin and our mess separates us from Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense. There's a hole inside of you that's empty that you're trying to fill with everything. It was designed for God. It's a brokenness. We are broken. Fallen out of the Garden of Eden. A sin nature. The solution for that was blood. In the Old Testament, it's continual blood. As we move into the New Testament, God, on his own behalf, entered the game, died on the cross to pay that price for all those who choose to accept that. If you've choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then he has called you on a mission for him to help reach the world who doesn't know him. Nobody gets out of that. The Great Commission is for everybody. We all have a part. We have to figure out what our part is. So we will be picking that up in a few weeks, looking at Titus on a mission for Christ. Next week, we will be looking at Passover. So if you want to study Exodus 12, read it. Get familiar with it. We'll be going through it. Part of the reason I think we're not on a mission for Christ is because maybe we don't understand all the things that are available. Maybe we don't understand and go, how exciting is it to be an heir? An heir with Christ. Can you even imagine that offer? That blows my mind. And then the next week we'll come back and we'll look at Passover, because or at, uh, resurrection, um, the fulfillment of Passover. 
for Christ today for us, and what that looks like under the new covenant. But in the meantime, we want to move into a holy time in our hearts. I really believe that. It's important sometimes to recognize, hey, seasons are coming. You know, when we take communion, God calls us to get right with one another, be in remembrance of him. As we move towards Easter, this is the highlight of what we do to remember him. We follow a God who is alive, living, active, working in the lives of people in crazy ways. I cannot even fathom what God sees as the Holy Spirit works in the lives of humanity. It's unreal. Just the things I've been allowed to see as a Passover, as a pastor. And I have Passover on my head. Passover, Passover, Passover. It's that important to me. It really is. It really is. So, as a pastor, what God sees, what he's provided in his lamb, what he's provided in himself, is astronomically important. And we sometimes get it simplified down to a little egg or something, right? Or an Asherah pole, like we learned about today. So, Father God, help us. Help us as we seek you. Help us grow closer to you. Our Lord, we thank you that we have the example, like the Apostle Paul, to just raise that bar up there for us so we can learn how to run, run with you. And so, Lord, uh, we know that running the race, it's something you've invited us to. It's a privilege to be in a race with you. It's a privilege to be in a relationship with you. It's a privilege, Lord, that you have stopped and, and called each one of us. And so, Lord, help us on a personal level learn what each one of our little ministries is, whether it's where we work, where we live, those around us. Lord, I really believe you've pressed a ministry on all of our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray you continue to press that on our hearts today. Help us grow closer to you. Help us grow closer to one another. Lord, um, I pray that you teach us what it means to fervently love one another, deeply love one another. I pray that you give us a patience to grow closer to one another like we never have. Lord, I pray that when you look down at the Dallas Evangelical Church, you don't see a church, not a building, not a steeple, but you see your body working together, living together, loving together, and laughing together as we share you with the world around us. We pray that in Jesus' mighty name.